Where was that? In Knoxville and uh, Tennessee. And then I uh, went to college at the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville again and continued the ROTC work at the university. And when I graduated from the university, I got a second lieutenant commission. Uh, and then the, I left the university as a chemist and went to Oak Ridge uh, as a chemist and worked there for two years, I guess, or a little more. You majored in chemistry in college? Mm-hmm. And, uh, however, I was working, we were studying enzymes and the effect of radiation on the enzymes. And so, uh, after I was there as a junior chemist, for a couple of years. I got tired of going to work before sunrise and coming out after sunset. So uh, I uh, volunteered for the Army since I had a Class D deferment because I was working at Oak Ridge. And I had to figure out how to get rid of that. And because uh, the oh, Korean War was just getting warmed up and so I uh, left the Oak Ridge and went down to uh, Atlanta where the headquarters of 3rd Army was at the time and I talked to the chemical officer down there and uh, I guess he had something to do with it because several weeks later I got some orders to uh, report to Fort McClellan, Alabama. And an approximate date? Uh, it's all in there. Okay, we'll get it later. It's all in the records. And the, uh, I guess that was uh, 65 maybe? No, that's, that's not right. Mm. It'd be more like 55. Yeah, 55. And, uh, so then uh, I was assigned to uh, Fort McClellan and uh, they were beginning to prepare for a maneuver in Texas, which is known as the Longhorn Man Maneuvers. R maneuvers. And uh, so as a, by this time I was a first lieutenant and as a first lieutenant, I was one of the senior people <laughs> that was at Fort McClellan. So uh, the I had been in a chemical maintenance company in reserve. And so when I got to Fort McClellan, there was a chemical maintenance company that they had just activated from Arkansas. And uh, they had, it was run by two second lieutenants and it was not being run at all. <laughs> they couldn't agree on anything. So uh, they assigned me to command that unit. And uh, so we did. And we, started commanding that unit, got rid of those two or three second lieutenants and and the general, of course they were concerned about being ready for that maneuver. And so I was walking down the street and uh, ran into a sergeant that I had known at summer training camp who knew all there was to know about a chemical maintenance company. So uh, I had a subsequent little meeting with the commanding general 
And I said, I want that guy. And so he said, you got him. <laughs> and so that was, uh, that was very uh, beneficial. He was, in fact, knowledgeable of everything that, that needed to go on in that uh, company. So we took the uh, company to uh, Fort Hood, Texas, and then out beyond Fort Hood a little bit to Lubbock, Texas, and uh, set up the company because they wanted gas masks for the incoming maneuver troops. So they needed uh, about 200,000, uh, 200, uh, about 20,000 masks. And what they had done was to ship from the depot at uh, Memphis, they shipped some 200,000 masks that they had in the depot there that uh, had been collected after World War II. And so it was our job to survey all of those masks and try to find 20,000 of them that would, could be issued to the maneuver troops. How successful was that? Mm -hmm. person? What's, how successful was that? What percentage do you think were good? About one in 10. 10 percent. <laughs> yeah. So uh, we uh, sorted those out and the company worked as a gas mask repair outfit for, uh, I don't know, for several months. And so that by the time the maneuver troops got there, we had a mask for all of them. And the, and the maneuver included uh, the use of tear gas uh, to uh, keep the guys aware that they, they had a problem sometimes or could have a problem and the masks of course made it possible for them to continue the maneuver. Uh, anyhow, we uh, finished that up and then we went back by convoy to uh, Fort McClellan and uh, that was when we had the new automatic transmission trucks I don't really remember what they call them, but if you remember army trucks at all, it was, uh, they would shift out of gear at uh, about 30 miles an hour. They'd shift back and forth. And of course the convoy was running at 35 or thereabouts. So they were tearing up the trucks faster than we could you know, simply because the automatic transmissions were shifting uh, far more uh, frequently than they really should. Exceeding their design. Yeah. So, so the uh, we got a, got finally got everything back to uh, Fort McClellan, and uh, I was. Uh, about to get married at that time, I had met my future wife while on leave at Christmas time, and uh, so we had a, had a wedding scheduled for May, and uh, that was right in the middle of, or no, it was right at the end of the first course officer training course that I was in. So uh, we went back to uh, Fort McClellan and uh, finished up the first course and went back to Knoxville, Tennessee and got married uh, in May. So the problem was, of course, that I couldn't get, couldn't be long gone from uh, school. So uh, anyhow, uh, that caused some consideration to change the date back and forth to 
to fit my schedule. Anyhow, the um, I moved then from that course to the uh, officer advanced training course and uh, then after that course uh, which I was I don't know six weeks long or something like that uh, I was assigned to the school as an instructor on atomic energy and that sort of thing because I had come from Oak Ridge and I, had, I knew how to spell it. That's about, the, about all I knew about it was how to spell the words. And uh, so Oak Ridge gave me an entree to the school instructor group. So I was assigned as an instructor to uh, the school and uh, out there, I guess, for three years or so, and then they wanted, uh, they started the nuclear, a nuclear tests, the air, the atmospheric nuclear tests in Nevada, and uh, Operation Teapot, that was known as, and. Uh, so they needed somebody that knew how to spell radiation and uh, I was assigned as the, as the uh, radiation dosage control and we had a little group of enlisted men to, to develop the film badges that came in from the field and run them through the machine to determine whether or not there was any radiation measured there and if so, how much. So we went through, I don't know, 30,000 uh, troops, I guess, were in, eventually involved in, in Operation mm -hmm. Teapot. So... Uh, and they all had these? Mm -hmm. They all had these badges, or what do you call them? Yeah. Yeah. And were they uh, accurate? Oh, yeah. Yeah, they, 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 they really, they didn't, we didn't find that they had been exposed significantly. Most of the badges were reading zero. And uh, so we uh, got the, uh, well, you know, they rotated the troops in and out and uh, the only people that we had any real exposure on were the permanent troops that were there and they went into each, uh, into the ground zero after each detonation to measure the things. So uh, that, on those we got some dosage and uh, we then could move around and go out into the field and and observe the houses that had been blown down. You know, they had built typical houses out there and uh, the purpose, I guess, was to find out how vulnerable ordinary houses were. And uh, so we went out and observed the damage to the houses and and uh, stayed in them a little bit, but there wasn't any radiation to speak of out there. Uh, not not where the houses were, but of course, as you got closer to the zero point, the radiation went up significantly because one of the things that we learned that we taught there was how to how to measure the uh, extent of contamination and the technique then and I guess still is you would take a vehicle and with an individual in it with the meters 
to measure the radiation and run him in as far as he could go toward the zero, ground zero point. And he had to come back when, he, when his meters were read high. And so that turned out to be the way that we uh, measured the contamination around the detonation point. So uh, after, uh, after the series of tests was over, or in that in that process, I had met the the guy who designed and built the instruments that we used to measure the dosage on the film badges, and uh, his name was Howard Eberline, and so he then was uh, setting up or starting a company known as Everline Instruments Company. And uh, so we uh, enjoyed knowing him and learning about his business uh, efforts to build instruments for the nuclear program. And then uh, we went back, oh, by the way, uh, in order to get to Nevada test site, we had pulled the house trailer from Anniston, Alabama, all the way across the country to Nevada test site, and then hooked it up there at Indian Springs, uh, Nevada, which is a little, a little bitty town had one grocery store, one, not, it was just a, you know, like you see in the filling stations around here, mm -hmm. a little tiny store. So we uh, lived in that and the wife, of course, kept all of that going and kept the, uh, our daughter was uh, with us. She was about three years old at that time. And uh, her bed was the couch in the front of the trailer. And so the trailer was parked so that the front of the trailer was facing the airport, the airfield. And uh, there was a, a B-36, which had uh, six propeller engines and four jet engines. And it was always parked there, but it took off once every time that we had a series of shots. and. Uh, that noise, that racket that he made always woke the daughter up from her naps. But anyhow, that's uh, a little sidelight. So after that tour in Nevada, we went back to Alabama to resume my job as an instructor in the chemical course school and uh, but at the same time I had a, a friend that I had met who had been assigned to uh, France to base section which was the, the army organization next to the coast uh, and he was the chemical officer there at, in base section. And he arranged or asked that I come work for him. In France? In France. So I did and we moved to France and had some lovely people who, who had converted a, 
one of the old houses, old storage houses that they had for coal. And they had converted, cleaned it up and converted it into an apartment. And so they let us rent that. And uh, when we came in with washing machines and refrigerators and so forth, they said, oh my, we don't have that whole complex that they had, had only uh, a couple of amps electricity total. And so we had to uh, ad adjust things to operate on uh, low electricity. Whereabouts in France? At La Rochelle, which is the port down on the eastern coast, uh, western coast of France. It's a nice little town and it's a beautiful place. The uh, harbor of La Rochelle has two towers on either side of the entrance. And in order to keep raiders out of the port, when there were raiders around, they had a big chain that they would hang between those two towers so that the raiders couldn't, couldn't just sail in. They had to get around that chain somehow or other. So it was a very picturesque place to be and we enjoyed it very much. Uh, but then the headquarters that I was assigned to, base section headquarters, was moved up the road to Poitiers. And Poitiers is about halfway between La Rochelle and Paris. So uh, we moved up there into government quarters up there. But uh, then we uh, did what one does. Uh, actually, what I had done, or what I was, what I had done was to write a regulation uh, for to train teams to do that monitoring that I had seen done in Nevada in case they had an accident of some sort in uh, that region. So, and that regulation then required that each commander in a region establish one of these teams to be able to go out and measure uh, radiation if it existed because that whole area was the area that if the Soviets moved in Germany, all of the dependents that were living in Germany would be required to, to evacuate to base section. We had to have tents and so forth ready for them. So uh, after we moved to Poitiers, we got that regulation that we had written, published, and issued so that the commanders would have a basis on uh, to uh, draw the troops together and and uh, then we went out to train them and so we went to I guess it was six different places we had these these uh, teams formed and uh, then later on in the uh, in the season There was a uh, maneuver known as Desert Strike where they had uh, armies and divisions moving across the desert 
there in southern Nevada. Uh, so one of the unique things about that particular maneuver was that was the first time, and as far as I know, it was the last time that they actually issued real nuclear weapons to the guys to carry around in the desert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, I was assigned to set up a system to keep track of the weapons if something should happen because... Would the weapons be shell-like? Hmm? Would the weapons be shell-like? Yeah. Uh, or missile heads, either shells or missile heads. And uh, so I moved down to Needles, California, which is where the... So how long were you in France then? Hmm? Uh, roughly how long were you in France? Three years. Uh, so, uh, of course, this was while I was still in France. And uh, the, we were fortunate in that, in that maneuver, none of the weapons were dropped or spilled or whatever you do, whatever could happen to them. And so the, the, we had moved one of the teams that we had formed and trained uh, moved them down to, to be available if we needed one from the accident standpoint. Down to where? To Needles, California, because the desert, the maneuver was in the, the whole desert area back mm -hmm. and forth. So um, they had uh, red troops and blue troops. <laughs> so, that whole thing was uh, was potentially very risky, but it actually it turned out it was not. No, no accidents occurred, and that's good. So, uh, when that was all over, went back to I guess actually I, we had been reassigned, well we were at that, in, during that same period, uh, President Kennedy was shot and uh, so I was on orders to Vietnam and uh, when he was shot, my orders were changed, so I was assigned to the Presidio at San Francisco, uh, which was a very, a very useful and nice tour. Beautiful place, but uh, we were there for oh, I don't know. I guess a couple of years, and then I got, I had orders to Korea, and uh, went to Korea, which was still in the wartime configuration, and uh, in Korea, I was Special Weapons Officer for the 7th Infantry Division. And uh, one of the jobs of the 7th Infantry Division was to provide uh, special weapons to the Koreans if the boom went up. And the problem was that as a special, as the special weapons officer, I uh, had a responsibility to be sure that they could do that sort of thing. They could issue the weapons. And uh, so I got to looking at it and discovered that 
that in order to clean out the maximum security area where the weapons were stored, in order to clean them out and get them going somewhere, it would take, uh, you know, like two or three weeks of all the trucks that we could, could uh, muster. And uh, so I said, that won't work. The, uh, the division had orders to move laterally along the front line. And here we sat with, with an anchor in the special weapons uh, storage area. By that I mean we, we couldn't move the division as long as those weapons had to be protected there. And so I uh, got my, I had a copy of the inventory of what was in the maximum security area. And so I did some calculations and determined that there's no way that we, we, we could get those things out of there in any reasonable time. It'd take a couple of weeks to move all that stuff out. And uh, in the meantime, of course, the division was stuck. It was tied down. So I uh, took the story into the chief of staff, Colonel Morgan, and uh, I told him, and he said, well, he said, uh, are you busy? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, he said, well, let's go in and see the general. So we got up and went in to see General Chester Johnson. Uh, he was a, bit, a baton death march participant. So... Uh, we went in to see him and told him the story, and, and he was kind of upset because he had two missions that he, and they yeah. conflicted, and he and he didn't know he had that conflicting mission until I came in and told him. <laughs> so anyhow, he got on his helicopter and took off to uh, headquarters down in Seoul, and. And I think that as a result of that problem, uh, that was the trigger that caused the, all of the special weapons to be withdrawn from Korea. As you know, mm -hmm. they have been now, but it took several years to redo all the planning and uh, that's one big burden, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And uh, so that that was effective in the sense that I was on orders back to the States shortly, so I didn't, didn't see much happening while I was there. But uh, the general was upset that he had two missions that he couldn't, couldn't match. Uh, and so I'm sure he went down to the headquarters and, know. and said, hey, I got a problem. <laughs> so uh, as a result, uh, they, there are no nuclear weapons in Korea, uh, South Korea now. Uh, so I think I had something to do with that. Um, came back to the States. And uh, I guess I went to the advanced officers course or something. Where was that? At Fort McClellan again. And uh, then I left that and went back to the university and got my master's degree in chemistry. Uh, and Which university? Tennessee. And uh, My major, my principal professor was George K. Schweitzer, who is still around, who's still alive. I hear from him every once in a while, rarely. But, uh, 
So you were still in the military when yeah. you got your matches, right? Yeah, still in the military. And so after I got out of uh, the university, I had a master's in chemistry. And uh, so I was assigned to the Army Nuclear Defense Laboratory at Edgewood Arsenal in Maryland. So, uh, and I was assigned as the ch chief of chemistry in that laboratory. And so, uh, the laboratory was, was the uh, source of, you may have seen pictures in, of the, of the uh, detonations where they had rocket trails going up on the, between the, on the side of the, or on the, between the camera and the detonation, you had these rocket trails going up. Mm -hmm. Those rockets were to measure the uh, contamination that was being formed. And our laboratory was the one that, that was responsible for getting those rockets launched. So, uh, and of course that was, I'm getting the story confused now because I have, I have come back to the, the tour at Nevada and uh, so uh, Well, anyhow, I uh, was then uh, reassigned from from that position to go to the Command and General Staff School at Fort Leavenworth, and we did, the wife and I and daughter, went to uh, Fort Leavenworth, uh, Kansas, I guess it was. And uh, was there for nine months, completing the officer's staff training office, office officer. So uh, after that, I thought I was going to the chief of the office of the chief of research and development, but uh, in fact, I w had been. Uh, requested by the then commander of the biological laboratory, the Army Biological Warfare Laboratory at Fort Detrick. Where's that? Hmm? Where's that? That's in Maryland, Fort Detrick, Maryland. And uh, so we did that. We moved to uh, Fort Detrick and uh, that was uh, a new, uh, that was another story. <laughs> uh, a lot of things happened while we were at Fort Dietrich. Uh, trying to get them in some sort of order. One of the things that we faced when we moved to Fort Dietrich was that the town at which which is there is Frederick, Maryland. Well, Frederick, Maryland is one of the, or was, and I think it still is, one of the original Jim Crow towns. Because uh, they were very, very uh, oriented against the uh, blacks and uh, so we had a bunch of, of uh, black soldiers on the base with uh, the, in the in the laboratory in the biological laboratory and uh, oh by the way uh, being there as the deputy commander of the 
biological laboratories, uh, I was immunized against 26 different biological agents. So I had a whole lot of shots. But uh, our problem was finding a place for these black families to live. And these weren't really able, nobody in the town was willing to accept them. So I was told to go represent the army at the Chamber of Commerce of Frederick. And they met once a month, I guess, and I met some of the senior people there and uh, convinced them that they just could not continue the town's policy of uh, discrimination because we had soldiers that needed a place to live. And uh, so we finally got got that logjam broken open right. and then uh, the soldiers could find a place to live then because the landlords were receptive because the Chamber of Commerce had told them that you either be receptive or we'll, we'll uh, you wish you were. Wish you were. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, uh, that was uh, an interesting and useful sort of thing that we could do at Fort Detrick. And the, there is a story that goes with Fort Detrick that they were not happy to have the Army Post there, particularly the Biological Warfare Post. And uh, so they had established a habit of making it difficult for people to shop and buy things in the town because, uh, you know, that they just didn't want anything to do with the people that came from the post. So uh, somebody, it wasn't me, but somebody said, well, we'll fix that. And they said, so how did they fix it? Well, what they did was they got a shipment of $2 bills in to uh, and paid all the troops and all the civilians that were working there their monthly wage or whatever in two dollar bills Not too bad. and so when the town realized that <laughs> all these two dollar bills came from the post they weren't so unhappy anymore <laughs> it's an amazing story yeah so i thought it was interesting and uh, but i don't know who dreamed that up, but it was uh, effective to say the least. And uh, oh, the uh, commanding officer there was Colonel Olenchuk, and Colonel Olenchuk was a rather short individual, and I'm rather tall. So we had to be careful that when the pictures were made that I was uh, in the right position so that he didn't appear to be unduly short. But uh, then his replacement came in while I was there and he was short also. So anyhow, I had the problem of giving the uh, welcoming speech at the club to uh, farewell speech to Oldenshuk and welcoming to <laughs> Gershader. And uh, that was didn't go very well because one of the things that I said was that 
it was fortunate that the box that Karen Odenchuk stood on to get <laughs> shaved <laughs> would be appropriate and used for Karen Gershaw. <laughs> that was not a good idea. <laughs> so anyhow. Uh, Let's see what else happened at Fort Dietrich. Oh, we had. Uh, you remember uh, we have uh, Sunday News has Chris Wallace, right? Yes. Well, his father Mike. was Mike Wallace. And Mike Wallace brought his 60 Minutes team down to the post and wanted to know what was going on and so that they could make it an item on the 60 Minutes program. And uh, so I uh, escorted, them, escorted them around a, a bit and uh, oak, uh, Fort Dietrich had, at the time, the only pure strain of white mice for ex for experiments and so forth. Uh, and that was one of the unique features. Another unique feature of it, that they had had years beforehand, they had had a maintenance person who had opened the exhaust vents for the anthrax laboratory. And uh, he got a dose of anthrax and he died from it. So we had one fatality on the record. How long did it take them to die? Like days or weeks or months? Oh, uh, not very long, uh, days. Anthrax is pretty, pretty mean stuff. Uh, but anyhow, we, uh, of course, Mike Wallace was very interested in that particular circumstance. And he said, well, how many accidents do you have here, or have you had here at Fort Dietrich other than that one? So my, uh, Chief Safety Officer was there, and he had records of every every light bulb that had been broken, and so forth. So he had thousands of records of, of accidents, and of course, Mike Wallace made a lot of noise about that. He said, "Here we are at, at the Army Biological Laboratory, that and they have had thousands of accidents." <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, uh, I uh, I no, there's no way I could get around that because he had the information from my safety officer. Right. Uh, so anyhow, that was uh, that was Fort Detroit. Moved from Fort Detroit then to. Uh, Oh, Fort Detrick to uh, assignment in the Pentagon. And uh, I thought that would be in the Office of the Research and Development all again, but it turned out not to be. It turned out that I was assigned to the, as executive officer, to the uh, Army Ballistic Missile Defense Agency. At the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. At the Pentagon? Well, it was in a different location, but it was a part of the Pentagon organization. Uh, and uh, that organization evolved into a uh, into a separate organization known as the 
Ballistic Missile Defense Agency. And uh, so I served there as a, uh, as a, uh, a, a deputy to the uh, director there, because the director of the program was uh, a civilian. And the program was actually run out of out of uh, El and what was your rank at that time? Lieutenant Colonel, I guess. And uh, so we had a uh, brigadier in charge of, of the operation at at Huntsville, Alabama, which is where everything was was done. Uh, that was the operating arm, uh, and the director and I were in the Washington arm, you know, to take care of Washington, Washington activities. Uh, and uh, one of the, the missiles that we were developing is in the box over here. Uh, the model of it. So uh, we got the uh, assignment or the uh, time came when we had, we were thinking about how do we deploy these anti-missile, anti-missile anti, anti -missile defense weapons mm -hmm. around the country because we would have to have 60 odd launch points for these, for these killer missiles. And uh, so the answer, the question was, how do we build 60 of these things very quickly? Are, and, those, are those the ones called Nike sites? Well, they were, they were uh, anti-aircraft. The, the Nike sites were, and what we were doing was trying to make anti-missile, incoming missiles, mm -hmm. uh, be able to shoot those down. And uh, so, the problem was that the radars that were the key to guiding one of these missiles up to intersect with an incoming ballistic missile was uh, you had to have a very special radar that could track both missiles at the same time. And at that time we were dependent upon nuclear warheads to detonate near the incoming missile, which today they now, today they can hit them head to head. So they no longer need the nuclear warhead. So uh, the problem with Deploying the the unit was that I had to have somebody that would build the build the uh, radars, and General Electric Company was the holder of the technology. So we went up to see them, and they said, "Well, okay, we can do we can do the number of radars you need." But where are you going to put them? So uh, we went, got to thinking about that, and uh, we built a sample unit out at Quadrant. And what it was was that I had asked General Electric if they could make the radar to fit in a 18-wheel truck and then c 
cable cable to hook uh, hook up however many they needed to uh, make the thing work. And uh, they said they could do that. And so what we had to do was to build the concrete bunkers to put the trucks into. And so we built one in Kwajalein and it worked. By that I mean the trucks fit. It was designed to hold the trucks. And uh, so they, they built the radar and we stuck them in the concrete bunkers that had been wired for the radar and uh, they worked. And we could have, uh, you know, with that thought, we could have built 60 uh, sites rather quickly because all we needed was a concrete uh, bunker. bunker. And uh, so all you needed was concrete <laughs> and somebody that knew how to form it. So that was possible now because then uh, GE could make the radars and, and we could get the bunkers built. This is, there were to be, had to be 60 of them around the country in order to protect the whole country. I'm sure you figured out where the other 59 or 60 ought to be. Yeah. Yeah, that was the next step. We didn't get to that one because uh, Reagan came in and, and uh, all of a sudden the program died. Well, I got beyond myself in the story. Because before we got into this uh, radar bunker problem, I had been assigned to the to the uh, program that was to make gasoline from coal. So I did that and uh, we had uh, we had developed uh, a, a process that worked very well, but it was a small scale. I mean, it was a, it was a plant, but it was It's very small compared to what you needed. And uh, so having the uh, idea to convert coal into liquid, there are several processes to do that. And so I was uh, asked to head up the, to be the head of the five programs that were to build plants to convert coal into liquids. And so that, that one, when did that occur? <laughs> I had to get my record out. Fascinating. And so we had, uh, had the one pilot plant running, which was producing. Where? The, it was in uh, it was on the Charles River just uh, west of Charlotte, West Virginia. So, uh, it was just, as I say, it was just a pilot plant, so it was rel relatively small. 
but uh, we had uh, several different programs using different technologies to prove that we could, in fact, make liquids from coal and uh, we could do that and uh, we made Exxon had explored that idea and what we did was simply encourage them to proceed and they, they wound up building the pilot plant down in Houston and uh, the other the other four processes never really got off the ground but we trained an awful lot of engineers <laughs> you know with uh, as to how one could could do this and so they're, uh, I guess they're all gone by now. Uh, that was a long time ago. So my point, uh, I guess, is that you can make liquids and gasoline out of coal, but you have to be prepared to pay for it. We had, uh, we had, uh, developed the processes very well, fairly well, and uh, we're ready to uh, start building some plants. Or at least the Conoco Oil Company was, and some other people, Exxon was ready to start building real plants and uh, Conoco was ready to start building a real plant. And uh, at that time, Carter quit <laughs> or left and Reagan came in. And the first thing he did was say that we can't afford these uh, synthetic oil plants. in the current budget. Of course, uh, the current budget at that time was, as I say, I had uh, six different plants going and my budget was, what was it, almost six billion dollars. And so, I, you know, for each, each plant and uh, so he said, he said, well, you know, we can buy oil from the Middle East for less than you can make it. And that was the point, is that it was available from Saudi Arabia for $20 a barrel. And our processes would cost about $30 a barrel. So he said, well, we can't afford that. So we shut down the whole program and uh, So anyhow, that's, uh, that's the story of the coal conversion processes. So we had five processes that worked fairly, fairly well. And uh, if we had succeeded in building the plants, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. Let me ask this right now. Uh, do you want to take a minute or a couple of minutes for a break? Yeah, why not? Would you? Okay, let's set that off.